David Carballo is a professor of anthropology and archaeology at Boston University, and he specializes in Mesoamerican history, specifically for our conversation, the history of Teotihuacan, which was the largest city in Mesoamerica, rising to a population of uh, over 100,000 in the year 500, and the, you know, couple of centuries prior to that. And it's a really weird place because it's a place that doesn't seem to have the same social structures that we expect from a pla- from the the center of a civilization that is a hundred thousand strong. There's not a clear ruling class, there's not a clear uh, hierarchy, and it challenges a lot of our interpretations of what a complex society looks like. Yeah, and maybe there's some lessons to be learned in there. You know, it seems like the failure of this civilization came down to the death of trust in the superstructures that held it together. And so this is really important as we guide ourselves into the next era of humanity on Earth and as we reach beyond Earth and reach out to the stars. If you enjoyed the podcast, please share it with somebody. That's the only way that we're reaching more folks and getting better conversations lined up on the show. If you really love it, support us on Patreon. It's doing wonders for our production abilities. We have some new gear thanks to our patrons um, that we're putting into use this weekend, which is going to be really cool. We'll have more camera angles on the show and just higher quality imagery, and we're going to be able to release these much quicker. Uh, Plus, you get to come hang out. Uh, Once a week, we do patron chats and work out how this show is going to develop in the future and how we're going to make it even bigger and more far-reaching, how we're going to do in-person events and really bring people together to kick scientific revolution into gear. Enjoy the conversation with David Carvalho, and we'll see you next week. The scientific revolution starts now. I think that your work is particularly pressing right now because a lot of people seem to think that we're living through the fall of civilization. And it's hard for me to necessarily disagree because I think that for the way that I interpret the fall of civilizations is that I just see it as the end of a time, of a culture, where you do things a certain way and then the way that you do things stops working out. And it's not like the people go extinct and there's, you know, the, the earth is salted and none of their descendants ever live. They, they continue to some degree. And there is a shift that we're watching happen that feels like that might be the end of a certain way of life. People have always felt that, by the way. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But there's, I, I feel like, so, so you know, because we're going to talk a lot about Teotihuacan, and when you read through the history, there is the the last phase where they're like, okay, so it seems like things burned a lot, and people left. And I'm like, the people who were living through the town burning and were like, hey, I think it's the end times, were probably more correct than the people who were all along the way saying that it was end times. So there's definitely some point at which you are correct that there are and, end And then times. the Aztecs had to look at it, right, and, and see the embers of something that they didn't quite know what it was all about exactly, but they knew that it ended. And so they had, they had that, it sort of set the stamp for what civilization means. It's sort of this thing that lives and dies, which we don't totally embrace or we don't totally have that opinion of ourselves as a western civilization it's kind of strange and so to wrap that into a question that you can actually get a handle (laughs) onto is what does your study in mesoamerica tell you about the end of civilization um so there's a lot there (laughs) (laughs) and um i you know i I'd start by saying that I want to problematize the term civilization, right? I mean, you know, that comes to us from the Greeks and, and, and you know, Roman, a Greco-Roman tradition of civitas or, or you know, having, uh, like, achieved some level of understood culture that is our own versus the others who are in the Greek model barbarians, right, that are, that speak gibberish and are doing something different from us. And... I mean, oftentimes it's used pejoratively, right? If you are, you're, 
certain early civilizations achieve civilization or certain early societies, I should say, achieve civilizations, what civilization while others didn't. It's not a precise term. It's, it, you know, like people roll a whole bunch of attributes into it. Um, does it mean for some, it might mean the existence of certain technologies for others, maybe writing for others, shared art style or urban living. Um, so we can be more precise by defining those exact terms and trying to figure out when, you know, why do some, why did some societies develop agriculture, urbanism, writing, metallurgy, whatever you want to, sophisticated calendrics or something we might talk about for Mesoamerica. Um, I guess when I say civilization, to, to clarify, when I say civilization, I mean that there is a group of people who have a consistent lineage that allows them to generation after generation build on the knowledge of the previous generation in a way that seems goal directed. Uh -huh. like, okay. like if a civilization falls apart, all of those traditions are, seem to be lost, like into the, they split into a million directions and there's this like scattering of of culture yeah it's, it's like it it atomizes there's there's a moment where there's this perhaps the social construction of a whole and people participate in it and there's roles and you can be like a cog that fits into something and then at some point the machine shakes apart and as it shakes apart the people are spat the out technology can be lost but exactly yeah, yeah. that's kind of what i mean about civilization i, I, hear, you, I hear you dr kabaya saying that the technology played a huge plays a huge role in the way people think about civilization is that true? I think it is for the, like, traditionally in the Western world, it's the way that we've grouped cognitively ideas about predecessors. So, I mean, just the most obvious example is that in the early 19th century, starting in Denmark, uh, people started defining there being a Stone Age, a Bronze Age, an Iron Age. And so, I mean, that's a technological taxa. It's saying that you know, societies move through these different tool technologies in sort of a lockstep fashion, when in fact, it's not really explaining too much about the social organization of those people. But um, we still use those terms. I mean, we still talk about the Paleolithic or the Bronze Age. Um, mm. Isn't it interesting we don't include social tools in the concept of technology, even though they ultimately could be the glue that really holds things together? Right. I mean, and some of it is is the bias of the archaeological record. We dig up tools, they're, you know, they're, they're permanent, they're durable items, where it's much more ephemeral to try to get it societal organization over the years. But so in terms of the original, given this definition of civilization, which is like a cultural passage from generation to generation that allows for goal-oriented behavior, what does it look like for civilization to end? So, I mean, I, I, I'll draw on Mesoamerica in particular, and then uh, maybe Central Mexico more specifically, where I work, and then, the, and then Teotihuacan and that answer. So, you know, I would say that one could say that there is a Mesoamerican civilization. There are elements of what we define as Mesoamerican civilization that go as far back as 1,000, maybe even to 1,500 BCE. Um, and what I mean by that is, a, you know, a certain way of, uh, of feeding oneself, like a certain suite of agricultural practices, certain forms of architecture, pyram uh, pyramidal temples, plazas, ball courts for playing the Mesoamerican ball game, certain iconography that relates to cosmological concepts or even deities. And, you know, that core which um, actually Alfredo Lopez Austin, one of the great Mexican uh, anthropologists and historians who, who recently passed away, he called the nucleo duro, the hard nucleus of Mesoamerican civilization. And that you could say lasts at least 3000 years up until the time of the Spanish invasion and still persists with indigenous peoples today or even mestizo, meaning mixed ancestry uh, peoples of Mesoamerica today. So at that level, there's no collapse, right? There's no you know, civilizational collapse. That is the, the long durée of Mesoamerican civilization. Um, then and that's much it, in the same way that we, we would trace the West back to maybe Sumeria or something like that. If we went deep enough, like we could go through right. Rome and Greece. And 
honestly, our, I point this out all the time, but it's like, go and look at any public building or like a courthouse. Like it's basically a Greek temple. <laughs> like it's, it looks the same. We use the Latin language. And so there's this thread that weaves throughout it. But we would say that each one of those instances sort of blew up, blew apart for a minute and then came back together in some sort of new form. And it's yeah. the same sort of thing down, down in Mesoamerica. For sure. So as just a direct counterpart to that, the Aztec um, or the, the last culture, last pre-Hispanic culture of central Mexico. And in the same way that the mall in Washington, D.C. looks like, uh, you know, archaism of, in the Greco-Roman vein, even with the Egyptian monolith representing our founding father, um, in the Aztec sacred precinct of Tenochtitlan, there were purposeful archaisms to temple styles from Teotihuacan and from Tula, which is the Toltec capital um, that's in between the Teotihuacan period and the Aztec period. So they were really familiar with those artistic traditions, um, styles of architecture, and they drew on them explicitly. I mean, they were even excavating at those sites. So, you know, the Aztecs did what we call ancient archaeology. Or, you know, they were um, both venerating and exploring uh, those predecessor cities. And then made, so right next to the Templo Mayor, the great temple of uh, the Mexica Aztecs in, in Mexico City, is a, is a miniature Teotihuacan style temple, um, drawing on traditions just the same way the Supreme Court uh, in the U.S. looks like a Greek temple. Um, so they, they really had this historical memory and they saw themselves on drawing on what they would see as a Toltec tradition, the people of Tolan, and get into that concept if you'd like, um, of, you know, sort of earlier societies. And it's something that I do try to emphasize because oftentimes, you know, especially when people frame the so-called conquista or the Spanish invasion of Mesoamerica, they look at the Spaniards as drawing on earlier traditions like, say, the battles against um, Muslims on the Iberian Peninsula or even going back into the Roman period. But see, the Aztecs, like many Native American societies, are seen by the West in this light as being ahistorical, when in fact they really had this vivid historical memory um, of, did they see it as, uh, did they believe in progress? Did they believe themselves to be the, like, ascendants of this previous civilization, much the way we view our tradition in the West? Or was it, did they revere them in a way as if they were somehow some ideal civilization? Is, is there, some, did they have this same Western sense of progress? Each civilization is better than the next kind of thing? Um, I think that's hard to say, or I, I'm not sure that I'm, like, in a position to, to say that, I think that the texts that we have from the 16th century could indicate either. So there is sort of this idea of this golden age of the Toltec past where like corn grew taller than people. I mean, there are, you know, there's some myth history of like, of, you know, um, earlier races of giants. The Toltecs were, were uh, wonderful artisans. So that does suggest this earlier golden age, but there is also within Mexica Aztec thought, the um, narrative creations of cycles of um, the suns, like the famous Aztecs living in the fifth sun. There are previous episodes of creation and destruction of time and the world as, as we know it. And so the Aztecs saw themselves as living in the fifth sun of creation, but there were four previous ones that had existed and then come to a cataclysm again. Um, so there is, you know, I think many people would say that within Amarin traditions or particularly Mesoamerican traditions, there's a little more cyclical thought rather than linear thought in terms of the part of the time. But how does that change your response as a culture to being overcome? Do you know what I mean? So it's like we live in a culture where there isn't really a sense of cyclic rebirth, where, you know, we're always on the on the vanguard of history. We're always better than we've ever been before. And there is this there's this continuance of our identity that is that is manifest destiny that we will rise into it. And it seems like what you're saying about the 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 cyclic tradition is that there's a recognition of a periodic turnover. And so when you are part of a civilization that is aware of this turnover and then somebody like the Spaniards shows up, 
what is that? Do you just feel like you're you're processing the destiny that's always been laid out for you of 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 destruction? Like, what is that? What does that look like? I um, I think the texts are conflicting. It's a wonderful question, but I don't know how um, I would get at it. But um, you know, so for instance, there are texts that refer to prophecies that Moctezuma and and um, and you know other Aztec peoples were experiencing as um, uh, premonitions to the conquest. They, they seem very inflicted, though, with biblical verse, and and we have to remember those texts were written down, you know, after some twenty years or so of uh, proselytizing, and and it's hard to say how much of that tradition is captured, like in an original pre-Hispanic form, and how much has now become syncretic is is a mix of of indigenous pre-Hispanic beliefs and the new Christian order that was uh, infiltrating. Um, so, so that, that makes it part of those texts then problematize, like being able to successfully answer, um, that, that question. Um, I forget, yeah, was there another part of it that you asked? I think Shiloh has something he wants to say. I can hear him. I can hear him breathing heavily. <laughs> Lay it on a delay. It's interesting how... It's interesting how it's impossible to look at the past without the lens of your contemporary culture to some extent. Like, it's very difficult for us not to look at um, the technological progress as being, like, gainful even for the people. Uh, like, I think that the people who are conquering it in some sense believe they were doing a service to the people that were conquered. Uh, and... I just think it's very fascinating. Like we see this in myriad disciplines of science where we're not totally able to strip our sense of pride in our culture and our civilization from the way that we're looking at even the stars or something like that, right? We, we tell stories that reflect um, where we are right now. And so how difficult is it to be objective about the archaeological record? Like, how, do you find people dragging the, their values into the way they interpret the record? Yes, of course, um, but it just depends what level of question you're trying to answer. So if we stick really close to the materials and the context, we can say a lot of things that are grounded in very empirical evidence. We can say what people ate, what their houses looked like, um, you know, what products came from long distances, what were made locally, uh, we can say, you know, who had more, who had less. We can get at issues of societal inequality. So some of the issues we've started off with today are these really high-level cognitive ones. And, um, and sometimes the data set is just not really um, applicable or, or useful to answer those. And, and so we can sort of speculate and we can draw on the text that we have, the art that we have, um, like there's this really po new popularization of the idea that some of these ancient cities were quite egalitarian and uh, metropolitan and very uh, fair and just places to live, which begs the question, if that was so, why, why didn't they succeed? And so I wonder like how much do you, how do you appraise those interpretations uh, of the record? I think they there's like some... is it a reactionary interpretation as an attempt to tear down the capitalist system? Which I, I think that on some level I'm okay with that, but I just I wonder. Yeah, no, I mean, and you know, I have published along those lines of trying to think about a spectra of inclusion in whether it's cities or politics and decision making. Um, and we have lots of great examples from central Mexico. We know the political systems of the 16th century quite well. Um, it's a little harder to move those back in time, but you know, we can try to look at material correlates from what we know from the 16th century and see if they line up with what we know from the 6th century of you know, the, the archaeological record. Um, I do think that that trend towards highlighting Inequality. So, so really, I should say, you know, back up a little and say, um, in the 20th century, in the mid 20th century, 
archaeology became interested in evolutionary issues again. So in the 19th century, there was a lot of interest in anthropology and archaeology and evolution. It was in, in, a, in ways that we would, uh, you know, terms that we would now not use, like my problematizing the term civilization. But so, for instance, there were taxa of, you know, that there are stages of, of savagery, barbarism, civilization, et cetera. And so that, that existed in the 19th century. Then there was a, a huge pushback uh, by anthropologists saying, you know, that this is sort of useless and um, it's not getting us to understand people any better. And we need lots of description. We need to go out and document uh, the history of humanity, whether contemporary indigenous peoples around the world or um, the archaeological record. Uh, and, and so that was sort of the earlier 20th century had more of that focus. And then starting in the mid 20th century, there was what's known as neo-evolutionism. And it, there was this interest again in, in, in thinking evolutionarily about uh, societies and so, so-called complex societies. So people use then more neutral terms. They would use terms like there are band societies and tribal societies and chiefdom societies and state societies. And that was sort of a political hierarchy that, that people created. And it came with a lot of implicit assumptions of you know, what constitutes a state or a large governing apparatus. And they were inflicted by different, you know, philosophical trends. Some were more Marxist. So, you know, Marx, of course, talked about modes of oriental despotism uh, and, uh, you know, uh, versus the more sort of democratic uh, Athens or, you know, uh, or, or more or democratic formations of the classical world and then of more recent industrial Western Europe. Um, and you know, the, actually, when the more we look at it, we see, I don't want to say democratic, and democratic is a particular, you know, comes with its own particular uh, baggage of what that entails for somebody, but a, a more neutral term might be pluralistic. There, there are systems of governance that involve more people that allow access uh, by more people, whether it's directly mis making decisions or having some input in who the leaders are. Um, and we can see that both ethnographically and historically across the world. And it's not just a, a, uh, um, a formulation of the West and the rest, but you know, this sort of evolved in, in Western societies, not others. We see it in other places. Um, and now it's really, it's clear, I think, sort of from historical records and some archeological records that that existed, but like how to move, how to, how to um, either you know, move from, good detailed historical texts to the archaeological record is a methodological issue that, you know, a lot of us have thought about. Um, but just, you know, simply, sometimes we use tools that are developed in, in other social sciences. Um, so, for instance, looking at Gini coefficients, the Gini coefficient is, you know, a measure of inequality in, in societies. Um, but, and, and you can do that by different proxies. So, for instance, looking at the amount of living space that different families had and was there huge inequalities between, you know, social elites who lived in large palaces versus peasants who lived in small little hovels, or was there more equity in the total amount of space people had? You could can, also can look you, at Can you could give us a too. sense of what that was like versus Western, uh, well, maybe where we are today or where we've been uh, in modern times? You, you mean Gini coefficients? Um, yeah, and or do you it, mean specifically like what the profile of a place like Teotihuacan looks like? Yeah, I just was curious uh, uh, just to tie it back to the egalitarian narratives that have emerged from places like Teotihuacan. Uh, yeah, what was the Gini coefficient and what, what was it like? Well, <laughs> it, the answer is it depends on what data you're using to calculate the coefficient. Um, but I think there's solid evidence uh, though not incontrovertible evidence, that things that tear to a con were, were more equal than what we see in the U.S. today. So the, the current Gini of the U.S., I have to look it up, but I feel like it's over. So there's a scale that is zero to one. Zero would be a completely equal distribution of resources among the population. Let's say the, you know, the, the, the GDP were 100 and there were 100 people, everyone had one. Um, versus a, a one on the Gini index would be 
one family or one person has a hundred and everyone else has zero. Um, and so, you know, today most societies are, are somewhere around the middle. Some might approach 0.6 um, or higher. And I think and I'm, I'd have to look it up, but I don't remember where the, the U.S. is. Um, Teotihuacan and many of the more egalitarian looking Mesoamerican societies are sort of more on the 0.3, 0. 0.4 uh, range of that spectrum. And that's Maybe it would be fair to compare it to like an equal sized city in the West at the time or something like that. Do, do you have any sense of how it's, how it's stacked up to what was happening elsewhere in, in the world? Well, yeah, I mean, for listeners who are interested in this, I'd recommend the book 10,000 Years of Inequality, where a number of, and it was edited by Tim Kohler and colleagues, and so a number of colleagues looked at this cross-culturally. So there are examples from Mesopotamia and Egypt and the Andes and Mesoamerica. And so there are comparative cases of that where you can look at, at variations in, in inequality. Um, so, yeah, in the in the case of Teotihuacan, uh, it was... Um, you know, it, it was one of the biggest cities in the world during its day, and about 100 BCE to uh, 550, 600 CE. It had over 100,000 people uh, living in it. Um, and uh, Rome was bigger, and later in the sequence, Constantinople was bigger. Um, I don't know if there are any other European cases. There are some Chinese and Indian centers that would have been larger. Um, but in, it was the largest place in the Americas in the Western Hemisphere at that time. Uh, and, um, and likewise, the, the later Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan that probably had over 200,000 people, that was larger than anything in Europe, um, except for maybe Paris. Paris might have been about... Hmm. And how was the, what was the wealth distribution? Like, what are, where are these interpretations coming from? Are, are we, when people write about it being me, more egalitarian, were they... Referring to other, with respect to other Western civilizations at the time? Or well, Western I mean, cities? a lot of that work has been just using Gini indexes for across the world. I mean, so look at, so looking at the, the two most common indices are um, living space. So how much floor area that you, you know, you have for a household and then also mortuary goods. So what's buried within tombs of different individuals. Um, and those would be very, very so my my question about this is, and you've kind of you've said that there's a little bit of difficulty because depending on what data you look at, you're going to end up with a different result. And something something that I've always wondered about the claim that says the distribution of this this housing space was relatively egalitarian in a place like Teotihuacan is I'm like, Look, the slums of Mumbai are not going to survive a thousand years in the archaeological record necessarily, right? So is it possible that there were massive slums that surrounded this city that just don't, that, mm. where the people were so poor that the only artifacts they had were out of materials that have just decayed over time, right? Like if everything, um, if yeah, everything no, is cardboard shacks. Point. But yeah, no, um, so there was no cardboard. So, but what people would build of there that was perishable and simple organic construction. It was reed, it's, right? Uh, bottle and daub. But uh, so they, so the, you know, reed uh, posts or, or, you know, wooden posts covered in uh, sun baked clay. But that clay actually preserves, especially when it burns, it becomes something we call daub. And so when they mapped Teotihuacan in the 1960s, they mapped over 2,000 apartment compounds. And so that, that, to me, is the most amazing fact of Teotihuacan. Teotihuacan is the only pre-modern city um, that I've come across and I think that existed where, of that size, of over 100,000 residents, where the majority of the population, the dominant housing were multifamily apartments. Those were substantial. They were either built with... Um, uh, rock construction or adobe, and they've preserved. And where we've been excavating out in the southern periphery, a, a district called Lahinga, uh, we've excavated non-elite residences there. But then we do also have through the map some um, what were labeled as insubstantial structures. And that comes from accumulations of the, the sort of pieces of mud brick and daub that would have been on those other constructions. And there have been excavations in those areas. Some colleagues 
have made those. And you can see the post holes from the, uh, the um, more perishable architecture. Uh, there's still some debate about what exactly they were. Were they houses? Were they storage facilities? This, the city yeah, like was what if big. they kept huge swarms of slaves in just really crummy barns out in the countryside, like cattle or something? We, we would have no record of that, I suppose. No, I think we would. I mean, we have, you know, there's perishable construction all over the place and they, they would be using pottery. So we would see that, you know, they would be using obsidian as tools, like all of that stuff that is, is, um, is non-perishable would be around there. And, you know, people have done test excavations in those areas. Mm -hmm. So what, there were some other aspects that were deemed to be strikingly egalitarian too, if I recall. Um, maybe you can help me remember some of the other, like something about the way the houses were organized and the lack of a public uh, jurist, like the lack of essentially uh, a, a central place where the government was located, something to this effect, like there wasn't. Um, so this might actually be Tlaxcala, not Teotihuacan. Mm -hmm. So so, um, so Tlaxcalan was the city-state, the main rival to the Aztec Triple Alliance. So this is later. So this is a thousand years after Teotihuacan. Um, and there, uh, my colleagues have mapped what the entire city, and they've seen that there's um, uh, really it's this urban expanse of probably thirty to fifty thousand people. We do have some estimates because so the Tlaxcaltecas became the main allies to Cortez uh, and the Spaniards eventually after first fighting them. Um, and there it's this sort of contiguous urban expanse of joined, conjoined terraces where people would live and farm um, and uh, many different distributed plaza spaces without sort of a big dominating temple or pyramid complex mm. or palatial complex. There is a little ritual space, but it's it's disembedded from the the uh, the main urban expanse. Um, yeah, so that, maybe I was also confusing it with the Turkish the Turkish uh, counterparts because um, I think one of the I can't remember the, which the name of it was, but there's this similar complex that's being compared to Teotihuacan, at least in the pop archaeology pieces that I've been privy to. Oh, I wonder if that's Chatalhuyu. Uh, that's it. That's it. Really it. That's center. it. Yeah. But Teotihuacan has these huge temples, so it seems but are hard they palaces to... or yeah? Was so... there like a ruling class? Uh, is there evidence of that? There, are, I we would I would think there certainly was. Um, so it's so... hard for me to imagine a group of people without a ruler coming together and being like, "We're going to build these pyramids, and it's going to be amazing." Like that'd <laughs> be awesome if it happened. It would be, but I'm just like to me that would be revisionist history to the highest degree because there's not really an example of people being able to do that. Like even even ants have a queen. I, Do you know what I mean? So I, I disagree. I okay. mean, I, so the pyramids on the scale of Teotihuacan, yes, um, but there are other really fascinating cases. So in the U.S. in Louisiana, the site of Poverty Point, which is 1600 BCE or so, built by hunter gatherer, fisher forager populations. They weren't agriculturalists. They they probably moved in seasonally. Yet they erected. I think it is the, the second largest mound to Cahokia, which arose much later and after agriculture near St. Louis. Um, and it doesn't, it seems in the complete absence of any sort of coercion, there was no sort of coercive mechanism there. Rather, it was a much more um, cooperative undertaking. Now, you know, that doesn't mean that there weren't people leading the efforts, inspiring people to work. But um, when you see constructions like that, that are ritually focused, they're focused on religious order, they are more in the public interest. So if you have, you know, the society buys into the idea that, that that is the proper way to keep the world going or to venerate the gods, then they're committed to that mission. And so you can get much less coercive major construction. Now that's different from, let's say, large complexes that are palaces, because that ultimately is the residence of one noble family, or really large mortuary complexes. So the, the pyramids in Egypt are, of the old kingdom are quite different. Those were to bury a pharaoh. So it's almost like a really massive tombstone. And so it, it, that's directed at private ends. Where it's interesting how the private emerges from the public because these rulers were often treated as in literal personifications of some deity, right? And so it seems like what I'm hearing you say is that the, the even more ancient 
civilizations like the ones in North America didn't have that priest class that was inserting themselves into the mix or, or deifying some, you know, making a personification on earth of some ideal form, right? Yeah, at least they didn't do it in a way that is conspicuous to us. They're not buried in an elaborate burial in the center. The imagery that decorates, say, the pyramids of Teotihuacan, they had sculpture associated with them. We know the themes that, you know, are at least decorating those pyramids. And, you know, there are these abstract images of, of deities, a water goddess for the moon pyramid, a fire god for the sun pyramid, um, images of, of jaguars and, you know, supernatural entities. There's not a depiction of a ruler. Unlike the classic period Maya, who are contemporaries of Teotihuacan, where mm. those pyramids are dotted with sculptures to the rulers and with hieroglyphic texts that's elaborating on the, the exploits of the rulers, their, you know, their birth, their conquests, and the rituals they conducted. So that's, very, that's a very different model than Teotihuacan, and the two were contemporary. Hmm. Mm. So to, to clarify, the iconography at Teotihuacan is not ruler specific, and therefore you're suggesting that the, the organization of the society was not centered on this god king in the same way that it was in the Maya. Right, yeah. So there's no certain convincing depiction of a single ruler at Teotihuacan in any of the canon of art that we have for it. In over 100 years of excavating there, um, including under two of the three main pyramids, there's never been a royal burial found. In contrast to the classic period Maya, you know, there's a new royal burial found in some city almost every year. Uh, they're very lavish tombs. There's this dynastic focused imagery. Now, that's actually something that's different when there's a so-called classic period Maya collapse. The Maya reorganize themselves into this more um, collective, non-dynastically focused uh, um, society. So an example would be Chichen Itza, which is you know, one of the more famous Maya sites, has that imagery. It doesn't have the classic period imagery. Um, mm. and so, so societies can change and they can sort of reject a, an earlier political order in favor of a new one. Just to provide another example, like so when we actually have terms for rulers, in the classic period, the Maya referred to their kings as Kaulaha, which means holy blood lord, whereas the Aztecs referred to their um, rulers as Patwani, which means the speaker or the great speaker. Um, and they they were not um, they did not inherit the throne through primogeniture like classic Maya rulers did. Rather, they were elected by a council. Now, the election usually happened within the same dynastic line. It often passed from uh, brother to brother, or from uh, uncle to nephew, um, but it, it very rarely was a primogenitor situation. And just the, the way that they were linguistically referenced had to do with their ability to be a good orator rather than being having holy blood. And so it's a, it's a very different system that we can actually see within the language. It's really funny how we kind of have that going on in the West today, right? You have like the dynasties, even in our, our rulers, in this last century, it's so fascinating because we do have this vision of ourselves as being uh, democratic and so forth. But. but not all members of the dynasty win. Like, you know, Jeb Bush is not viewed as being a member of the dynasty that has a place of honor the same way that some of the other ones do. I mean, he didn't get a war. but No, but it's just like, I, I think that there is, there is the ability to pass it in a way that is not ensconced in... Um, it doesn't seem as calcified as it could be if, you know, instead of it's Mr. President, it's uh, Mr. Holy Blood Lord. Like that seems like a harder, like a harder mold to break. Yeah. So what was it, what was it like? What was it like to be an average person in Teotihuacan in the classic period? So um, that's a great question. And, and uh, one I've given some thought to working now for about 10 years in the Southern periphery of the city. Um, one thing we've seen in terms of, uh, in particular, bone chemistry is that uh, there's a, always, throughout centuries of occupation, a high migrant population, a high population of people who migrated to the city from elsewhere. It could have been as much as 40, 45% of the population living there. So there was this high turnover continually 
people were drawn to the city because of the economic opportunities it offered, the same reason that people move to cities today. And, uh, you know, what we've seen is though, you know, uh, although living on the periphery and being of a non-elite status meant that the apartments you lived in were um, not as decorated, they didn't feature mural art like you see in the, the center of the city, they were made of some rock construction, but a little more adobe construction rather than nice cut and dressed masonry like you see in you know elite buildings or more you know, upper middle class buildings of the center of the city. Um, so even though we see those differences, the public spaces they had, the temple complexes and civic buildings within their neighborhoods were very elaborate and they could be just identical to ones that you'd see in the center of the city. So there was this investment in what we would call social infrastructure, the places where people came together in groups to, you know, affirm bonds of ritual and community, uh, probably market activities, ball games that would happen in those neighborhood centers. And they also had access to uh, somewhat exotic resources within the Teotihuacan economy. So where we've worked, there were communities of people making pottery, and this is simple utilitarian ware like amphora and basic food production and storage vessels. There were obsidian workers who were making the main cutting tools for the city, uh, which didn't have uh, metallurgy. So obsidian was really the, the main resource for, for any cutting implements. And they were making lapidary adornments, but they were very simple ones. They're made from materials like slate rather than high end materials like jade or other green stones. Um, but so by producing those and producing them on a large scale for trade and export, uh, then they were able to acquire resources like shell coming from the, the coasts. Um, they had uh, nice, like we found one stone sculpted mask. There's a replica of that behind me here. Um, we found nicely decorated polychrome pottery. So these you know, hallmarks of what we would call within the patriarchal economy, elite culture, they had access to some of that stuff. Now, there are certain materials that might have been off limits, but it's it's quite remarkable um, the the level of access to nicer things that these non elites who probably represent the bottom quartile or third socioeconomically of the city had access to. It sounds like you're you're talking about a manufacturing class. Yeah, and that's I mean, Teotihuacan as a city was a, you know an economic hub where people came to produce uh, and engage in economic. Uh, exchange activities that I think was facilitated in large part by living in multifamily apartments. So what we see, you know, when people live together in groups of say 60 or more within one compound, we get the economies of scale that you expect out of early specialized economies happening within that group. Um, and so, uh, so, you know, of course, like the way that Economists would talk about economies of scale as, let's say, you were a pottery maker. There are many steps to making a pot to bring to the market. You have to gather the clay and the tempering agents and the, and the fuel that you're going to use to burn the fire. Someone then has to be forming the pots, mixing the clay. Someone else uh, could be um, throwing the pot and cooking it. Someone else could be painting it and bringing it to market. So there are several steps. And if you as a household do all of them, it's much, much less efficient than dividing up the labor and cooperating with others where someone is just doing that one path. Someone is getting fuel for fires all day. Someone else is getting the clay. Someone else is, is throwing the pots all day. And so, and that specialized labor, if that could happen within a cooperative domestic context, um, it really allowed for the ramping up of the Teotihuacan kind of economy compared to other parts of Mesoamerica at the time. Go ahead. Are you sure? I was just going to ask, just to, just to clarify, if they were able to enforce this ethic, or was what was there anything approximating a police state? Did it have a standing army? How was was law a big player in the peace and harmony of this civilization, or or was it just cooperative to the degree that people was it an honor society? Like how how did they maintain law and order? The short answer for Teotihuacan is we don't. We do <laughs> so. We um, we don't have the sort of texts that we have for later periods. 
but we often draw on the Aztecs, who again are almost a thousand years after them, uh, as as potential examples of uh, of what might have existed. Um, there's debate about whether there was a standing army at Teotihuacan. Some people think there was sort of a core military force that was uh, you know, organized at a state level. I tend to agree with this somewhat because one of you know for my dissertation work, I excavated an armory next to the moon pyramid, so they were mass producing arms, um, and that seemed like a very centralized effort. Uh, nevertheless, there could have been conscription so that we know from uh, the Aztecs and other societies where different barrios or neighborhoods, uh, extended family units needed to provide a certain amount of people towards the army. And, and you know, I do have a colleague uh, who thinks that the Tehuacan army was, was never a standing army. It was always done through conscription on a, a, a needed uh, basis. We do know that, you know, so within... Aztec society within the marketplace, there were judges there to make sure that exchange was happening in a fair way. So the market economy was was sophisticated and there were a lot of uh, pseudo currencies. There wasn't a coin based uh, economy, but things like cacao beans and textiles had equivalent values within a system uh, to the point where people would um, forge cacao beans. So they would make clay little cacao beans and try to pass them off in bags in terms of exchange. And then there are judges in the marketplace who would be adjudicating that and, and, mm. uh, and, and penalizing those who are bringing benefits. It seems like, correct me if I'm wrong, but there wasn't a fixation on expansion of territory the way that you might see it in a civilization that requires a large army at all times or requires like the harsh enforcements of its code upon people. Like it kind of reminds me of of like the Phoenicians or something that are just basically this like enriched market civilization that don't really require lots of territory because they're really just facilitating something for the peoples across some broader network. That's a it's a good uh, analogy. I mean, the Phoenicians also use pseudo currency. They didn't have coinage. They used like iron ingots and in, in their trading uh, colonies. I'd say the one difference is that the Aztecs were at a much greater scale, their cities were much larger, and there was actual conquest of others, but it wasn't, uh, so we would call the Aztec empire an indirect control empire or a hegemonic empire, rather than a direct control or territorial empire like the Romans or the Inca were. Um, and in an indirect empire, there wasn't sort of the, the um, uh, direct control of territory through putting in a garrison with a, a standing army there. Uh, to the degree that there are in the territorial empires. And so that fits. I guess I was thinking of like the Teotihuacanis yeah. even before them to. Oh, you know, even before. Yeah. yeah. It just seemed, um, did they, did they, were they fixated on territory? Was there any sense of this uh, enforcement or uh, it doesn't seem like there was. Cause like the armory that you excavate, is it an armory that is for conquest or is it for defense? Can you tell like, what's the size of it? How much, how armed are they? Well, th this was the production in particular of, you know, thousands of dart points. So the dart was thrown with an atolatl or a spear thrower um, and was sort of a fighting weapon uh, par excellence for Teotihuacan times. It's before the bow and arrow came into the scene and that actually changed uh, offensive um, tactics. Uh, they were also making some knives as well. Um, but this doesn't seem like, uh, well, at least the one workshop that we have uh, um, isn't of a huge scale, but it's significant. Um, but it's, it is hard to say, like, so we don't see the, 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 uh, territorial control also for Teotihuacan in terms of say, you know, uh, boundaries or, or garrisons. Um, what they seem to be really interested in is controlling corridors that could access different areas. Um, and I've worked in one of them that passes uh, in, in, through the state of Tlaxcala, east from Teotihuacan, and it would take you to the Gulf of Mexico, to the lowlands, where there's all sorts of different resources that were of interest, cotton, marine shell, uh, you know, bird feathers from tropical birds, uh, and, and other resources that they valued. So they did seem to focus on those, on ensuring that, the, that there was free passage, at least for Teotihuacanos, through those corridors. Uh, of communication, but they didn't create large territorial uh, formations. 
we potentially they were interested, like the Aztecs were, in taxing people, so that mm-hmm. you know, sort of um, to exert a dominance relationship and then require tax uh, from the province. Well, they, these roads don't build themselves, as they say. <laughs> That's so true. Um, did you have? Did you want to follow up on this? Because I have kind of a, a shift. Take it away. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, I have thoughts, but I'll come back to them. It's oh cool. no, no, let's 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 uh, stick with it. Well, I, yeah, no, no, no. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna. I want to ask about Iberia too, because you, you talk about that in your book as well. And okay, so before we go there, yeah, the whole lineage of how this uh, territorialism expands and uh, through the Spanish and so forth. But well, we'll come back to it. Uh, but I think that this is a good foundational question that I want to ask for that, which is. And this might be really stupid, but what drives people to organize like this in the first place? Like, you you know, you talk about specialization, you talk about the they want access to these resources and they want to be able to maintain this uh, this relationship to the earth that is fundamentally not particularly individualistic, right? Because we, or or even necessarily tailored to the desires of a family unit. Because you see this this conflict in our our own civilization, right? Or civilization, our own society right now, which is that the, the goals of the superstructure are not necessarily the same goals as the individuals within that superstructure. And it feels like, why would you come to a, you? You say that you come to Teotihuacan because you uh, can can do business there. There's you're, you're able to make stuff, and there's this turnover across all of Mesoamerica. But why not just stay where you're living, and farm and do your thing and live this kind of you know return pastoral lifestyle of mm. the the way that humans have always been, you know, the sort of the, the, the Eden. Like, why would you come to a dirty metropolis? What drives you to that place to then be subjugated into the machine that's like, we got to build a road so we have access to resources? Well, I mean, you could ask the same question to a New Yorker or other uh, urban dwellers today. Um, it's and- freaking hard is the answer. It's so hard to grow stuff and eat it and farm. It's really, really hard. And then you got the roaming raiders that are coming in every other season and stealing your crops. And I I could live in the suburbs for my entire life, and I don't think that a roaming raider would exactly. come for me in my exactly. suburb. But that's a, that's a, I would like suburb being like... Being a protected... C- I, fine, you can live out in the countryside, you know? You're going like, to have problems in the countryside. Well, but you live within a different nation state structure that has you know an army and policing forces that would protect you in those things and exist in, in the pre modern world. Um, so you know I so far talked a lot about economic factors. Um, but Teotihuacan, in addition to being an economic hub, was a political capital and was a religious center. And I and that religious piece I think is really important. I think what they did well was to create a vision of the city as the center of the world and as you know the activities the ritual activities that were happening there as um as uh, rejuvenating the world as as sort of reaffirming the world and and so a lot of the themes that we see in the religious iconography of Teotihuacan relate to things that were in the public interest so there's a you know the largest deity or the most impactful deity it's probably the storm god. Some people think you know, he might have been the patron deity for the for the city. Um, but you know, the storm god brought the rains, brought agricultural fertility in a semi-arid environment of agriculturalists. That's something that you know people would largely be invested in is is making sure that agricultural uh, abundance continued. Um, and so we have some great murals, for instance, from the city where uh, the storm god is raining down as people like, like frolic in in a water mountain and are, are playing the ball game and dancing. And, and so it's a utopic vision of this religious system leads to public goods uh, in this way. Um, there's also, you know, the famous feathered serpent seems to have either originated or really taken off at Teotihuacan and uh, one of the major temple complexes is dedicated to him. Uh, he's a, a, a deity associated with creation and the calendar and cycles of time um, and that also was then affirming these these epics of creation. But then, I mean, to get to the political element and, and to also, you know, 
uh, state really clearly that Teotihuacan was not a, a utopia in the strict sense of the world and did have hierarchy. You know, this religious system also um, ran on military expansion and human sacrifice. And so, you know, to the Feathered Serpent Pyramid, there are uh, a couple hundred sacrificed individuals that were in dedication of that temple. Um, and then it was desecrated maybe some 50 to 100 years after it was constructed. And people speculate, was this a reaction to you know, the, the sacrifice or the, the, uh, uh, the deity or the cult that it stood for? Uh, we don't really know. But there was a huge rupture, there was a huge reaction to that particular temple complex. Does it, does mm -hmm. it seem like, the, like if the religion is the sort of glue of society, do you see that religion start to come undone? Do you think that that might be a sign of people losing faith in their religious basis upon which holds everything together? Yeah, yeah, like do you gradually see a change in the way that the gods are represented in the art over time where it's like at the beginning there's this utopian vision of the storm god, you know, raining down upon us frolicking people and then towards the end there's something that's more aggressive or violent or angry? I don't think anyone has pointed that out exactly. You know, I mean, I can think of one mural where the storm god is holding like a, the lightning bolt is shaped like a spear, I mean, which is a little more militaristic element of that deity. But I mean, something that's important to note is that those two deities continue to be important through the Aztec period. So they never go away. There's never, like they are fundamental religious concepts in the central Mexican religious system. And in fact, the feathered serpent makes its way down to the Maya region, the pyramid of Chichen Itza is, is the feathered serpent. So um, it becomes a unifying force within Mesoamerica in other words, but um, whatever the social institutions associated with that religious system um, seem to uh, have a crisis of trust. And you know, this actually is what I think most, what we would call collapses are about is when there is a, a lack of trust. And once enough people decide that I don't trust in these institutions, they're not providing for me in the way that would make me want to migrate to this city or that would make me want to stay here, then the system collapses. And, and I think that's what we see sometime in the sixth century for Teotihuacan. Um, there's no evidence of some sort of marauding armies coming in and invading the city. Uh, again, I work on the, the periphery. There's no sort of burning of that area that you would expect if there's sort of anywhere on the periphery, if there's sort of like an attack from outside. Rather, there are these very targeted burning episodes of the, um, the seats of power, the, the temple complexes and the palatial or administrative complexes. There's iconoclasm, the smashing of statues and, and the burning of buildings. Um, and so that seems like a rejection of the order uh, due to lack of trust. Now, what precipitated that lack of trust? That's a little difficult to say. Some people point to environmental factors like a period of drought or volcanism. Um, but we also see social uh, um, changes. So um, there's some evidence that things became more stratified or hierarchical later in the city, that certain districts were getting more unequal. Uh, there's also... Um, some evidence that uh, in one compound uh, called La Ventilla, where my colleague Sergio Gomez is excavated, uh, there's almost what you might call a gated um, community phenomenon where areas that were formerly accessible get closed off or have like a way station in them, so, uh, like they were um, uh, trying to... Um, like a guard, uh, like a guard block, station? Right, to guard access into the area. And so, so that's a system that seems to be in crisis that there's a lack of societal trust in that system once you start dating off uh, your communities. Another colleague, it's Linda Montanilla... so hard to hear this without thinking about the death of God in the Nietzschean sense in modern times and, and this this lack of trust in the priest class. Dr. Benner is about to lose your mind. <laughs> the priest class is sacrificing people and they're sacrificing the people that live on the periphery of town. The, what you said right now, which is that you don't see the periphery burning but you do see the temple complexes burning, to me indicates an anger towards that specific practice. 
And I don't think the upper middle, I mean, I'm not sure about this, but I don't think that the upper middle class is the one that's being collected for sacrifice. They're not disposable in the same way. Maybe, maybe I'm totally wrong, but it seems to me like that wouldn't be who you would pull from because it's hard for me to believe that there isn't a very human desire for self-preservation. Like and you if, want the doctors and lawyers, basically. And not even just the doctors and lawyers, but some, which you do, but you also, Engineers. if you are a doctor or lawyer... You're able to be like, you know, I I don't know that I want Johnny to be sacrificed. Yes, I'm sure it's very honorable for the gods, but mm. I yeah, I like Johnny, or whatever, right? And yeah. so it's like, <laughs> I mean, it's it, unfortunately it seems more complicated. So I will say that the the sacrifices, probably a majority of them are from outside of the city. They're not from within the city. They were captured. You know, it, it, they were acquired in some way through military conquest, although there are a good number who were from the city or lived in the city. We get some in terms of class. There's some you know, com- complex issues. Uh, so in one example, in w- one of the moon pyramid sacrifices that has three individuals, two of them seem to be Maya dignitaries wearing really fancy jade and all decked out. Um, and so that's that's something different was happening there. We know that Pedro Khan had this sort of incursion, a military incursion, or some segment of Pedro Khan was into the Maya region, where previously there seems to have been diplomatic relations. Those soured at some point in the late fourth century, um, and uh, that might be a result of this particular sacrifice. But then you know, one other thing I would say is that the practice doesn't go away. In, in fact, if anything, it accelerates after Pedro Khan. So... Um, sacrifice in the Toltec or Aztec system uh, continues to be a way of of paying a blood debt and um, and uh, keeping the world going. And like that. forging an identity that's distinct from the outside world, right? It's like the whole purpose of culture is to make you part of the in-group as opposed to something chaotic that's out there that's different from you. And it seems like what better way to accomplish that than to take something from the outside world and claim, like a human being from the outside world and claim power over them as a civilization and stage these events like they, they, they just, it's hard to imagine anything else that would unite people better together. I mean, people do it with war today, right? We'll go as a civilization and attack a country uh, just because we can because we're so powerful and it, it's it's quite interesting how that seems to be a real necessity for gluing a civilization together. Mm-hmm. It also strikes me that the people who won the the conflict or the who the the inheritors of the social strife must have been the ones that were pro sacrifice. Right, so that whoever remained after a period of do, burning do you think and destruction. That, like, it was, do you think that it was really a top-down thing, or was it people really want... Like, people love sports, for instance. People love blood sports. People love war. Like, people love beating other people. Why would you burn the temple complexes where the sacrifices are... Ha- like, people don't burn the stadiums, right? Like, if you love football... You don't burn down the stadium. You you yeah. you hooligan and you burn the buses outside of the stadium because I you're like think this so much in sports. So I don't, you know. So right now we are at well, we just passed Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead in Mexico, right? And and I've seen some altars. We had a memorial for a, a dear colleague who we lost uh, uh, this summer. Um, I would think differently about ideologies of life and death, and that that are part of the long durée of, of Mexican history um, and, and sort of the reciprocal relationship between life and death and that death gives new life. Um, and, and, you know, ideas like uh, having a glorious death, which could happen through sacrifice or dying on the battlefield or for women dying in childbirth, you would be reincarnated as a butterfly that's sipping nectar from the flowers in the next world. Um, a colleague recently has sort of, you know, some people have made claims that some of this ideology could come from the great migration of monarch butterflies into the region uh, that happens right around this time. Uh, and um, so, you know, this massive, and the North was uh, the place of the dead within Mesoamerican belief system. So to see all these returning butterflies around now uh, seems connected to this ideology. When we see visions of like what Pedro kind of saw as a paradise, it's 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 butterflies and flowers and birds and um, and th- and these are also the souls of people who died valiantly feeding the sun or, or keeping the world going. Um, so it's a really different way 
than we've come to think of it in the Western world. And I usually think it needs to be part and parcel with any discussion about warfare. So um, in when we, you know, when we think about Mesoamerican warfare uh, was literally fought with sticks and stones. And I don't mean to like say that in a way that's disparaging technologically, but there's, there's no metal weapons, uh, you know, really of any consequence. There's some use in West Mexico. There's no cavalry. There's no major naval power. The ability to kill lots of people was underdeveloped in certain ways in Mesoamerica compared to warfare in Eurasia, where there was this ramping up of technology, like we talked about at the beginning of the hour, with developing bronze weapons and then iron weapons and chariots and, and, and fortifications and naval uh, battle. And so some of the you know, ideology that we would call, quote unquote, tribal or earlier primitive ideology of, of life and death and how to treat the dead um, still was there in Mesoamerican warfare, where there was just the inability to kill that many people on the battlefield. And so the objective you know, was often to subdue the enemy and actually conquer an area, but also to take captives back uh, for sacrifice. And you can't divorce just the practice of sacrifice or treating the dead from this whole religious system and this socio-technological system of warfare. I don't think that you can get rid of that need in civilization. I wonder if... For blood sport? For just, for sacrifice, you know, for, for, for violence as a unifying feature of a civilization. I mean, this will be the ultimate test of whether we can make it off this planet, I think, is whether we can get past that, because we, we really seem to need to other people in order to solidify our own culture. It seems like you can trace this back through, I mean, come on, the Mesoamericans weren't the only people sacrificing people. Obviously, like the ancient uh, Canaanite civilizations were famous for this. There's, uh, you see it in, 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 uh, in what we would, I guess we'd call the indigenous civilization uh, populations all throughout the world, um, even up to the present. It's, it's not a particularly unique idea to, uh, you know, sac ritually sacrifice your enemies in a way that is a party, essentially. You're, you're rallying around this as a civilization. It, it really glues everything together. What's interesting is that I've read that the collapse of Teotihuacan is maybe linked to a climactic event that happened in like 580, I think it was, where there was a uh, volcanism that prevented agriculture from being as effective. And so if you have this, this sacrificial practice that is meant to gather people and to ensure the survival of the civilization, and you have a storm god that is supposed to be protecting you, and all of a sudden it stops working, then you have, like you said earlier, the death of God, and then things shake apart because people don't trust in the ritual anymore. Is that, does that have any truth to it? I, I think it could be true, but that volcanism is not quite yet established mm -hmm. enough for me. Um, the volcanism that I think is very solid is what starts Teotihuacan, what makes it a big place. So the fact that Popocatepec, the really big volcano over Mexico City, um, erupted sometime around 2000 years ago, the exact dating is disputed, but let's say, you know, give or take 50 years on either side, uh, it was a huge eruption, a volcanologist would call it a VEI-6 eruption, which for comparison, when uh, Krakatoa, the volcano in Indonesia, erupted in the late 19th century, could be heard in Australia, that was a VEI-6 eruption. Um, and so that is really well documented uh, by volcanologists and, and geoarchaeologists and, and the impacts it had in making people migrate from the southern basin of Mexico and southern Puebla. Uh, both up to Teotihuacan and to another classic period city to the east called Cholula, that eventually made a bigger pyramid than any at Teotihuacan. Um, and so the start of Teotihuacan as a cataclysmic event that uh, precipitated migration to it, I think is very well established. Now, for the it seems like climate change could totally undermine your trust in a priest class that was supposed to be mediating. Uh, the dispute with the gods as well. Yeah, like whether or not it was volcanism, is it accepted that there was some kind of change in agricultural success at that point? Um, not not consensus, but I but there is some like there are some uh, precipitation 
proxies that suggest there was a period of drought around there. Now, this, the Teotihuacan had withered, uh, weathered other periods of drought before that. So I would say it's got to be some combination between, you know, there's ecological crisis, but there's not the social resiliency, the social plasticity to rise to the occasion and, um, and move on, right? So, um, so that seems to have been lacking in the sixth century, but, you know, they had uh, weathered other crises previously. So that some, you know, I always see it as a, a connection between the social response, the, the potential for social resiliency and any sort of ecological uh, or social crisis. And do you have a sense for what could have caused the social resiliency to decline? So some of the things I was mentioning earlier, like maybe heightened inequality, Another colleague, Linda Monsonia, talks about um, the different barrios of Teotihuacan, or the, the districts or, or the clusters of neighborhoods of the city, had a class of intermediate elites who weren't the governing class, they weren't the highest sort of ruling class, but also had power in the networks they created that held people together and uh, maybe sponsored trade relations and, and, and did other things, that their power might have risen at the expense of the more collective face of governance. And so they're sort of, even though the, you know, the, the, the state or the governing system was keeping this collective face of we are all one, the, this sort of the patron client networks within these districts were undermining that and that helped to undermine trust in the, the system as a whole. And then the, I also- The revenge of the it, oligarchy. It, right, yeah. I mean, so that's often a, Something we see politically, like a political scientist would call it elite fracture leading to a state. And, and so that could have been a contributing factor along. But, you know, so there was a environmental crisis and then the, the, um, the lack of societal resiliency. Now, I should back up just a little and say Teotihuacan lasted as the biggest city in the Americas for at least over 500 years, maybe pushing six or 700 years. So, you know, by and large, it's a success story. There's no, city in the U.S. that has come anywhere close to that. So um, it, it lasted a, a long time and it was a thriving civilization. And when there was the political collapse, there still were tens of thousands of people living in a ring around the former ruins. Um, they were familiar with it. I mean, there would have been historical memory of it. And then I mentioned the later Holtec and Aztec civilizations drew very conspicuously on Teotihuacan as an example of you know, early uh, urbanism and, you know, an early high civilization. In there. Yeah. Seems like New York City is the closest thing we got. But I, yeah. I guess the I Dutch, I mean, so. it's been so, almost 500 yeah, years. Yeah, 400. But, you yeah. know, so, uh, but New York's quite a success story too. And having lived there, questionable. Also but yes. a disaster, but you know. <laughs> this is such a fascinating topic for me because I feel like we tell ourselves myths about the past and those myths inform the way that we structure our own societies. And there's nothing quite like going to a place and actually sifting through the ruins that remain to 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 challenge our interpretation of those myths. And so your work really sits at this interesting place, which is the, the, the way that we see ourselves and the way that we see the, the human project, if there is such a thing. Uh, there wasn't really yeah. a question in there. Okay. Oh, we're out of time for questions <laughs> yeah, anyways. We're out of time for questions. Yeah, it's really, it's really fascinating work. Um, by the way, where are you located physically? I'm in my office in at Boston University. In Boston, okay. But you're are you down in Mexico a fair amount? I well, through the pandemic I haven't been, but I just got back uh this summer to restart the lab. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well I look forward to seeing, you know, what comes next. Are you working on a book or anything like that? Uh that you you know, you can hint at? Or? I mean you just oh, finished I, Collision yeah, of Worlds, right? That one, yes. I do have a book deadline of August with a colleague that I often publish with Gary Feynman is at the Field Museum. And this one's on cooperation and collective action issues. Uh, so it's this short series, it's called Cambridge Essentials. So it's, they're not, they're long, but they're just supposed to be targeted at that kind of issue. Very cool. Yeah, it's very cool. We'll link all your books in the description and I, I would really love to continue this conversation down the road.